A series of decisions in a single moment can create a ripple effect of outcomes that none expected and only few have prepared for. When your life is on the line, how quickly you act can propel you down a path of suffering and by simply accepting death is a sentence that will take you to your grave. Standing on a boat, slowly sinking in between towering waves of frozen water, a mayday call, and the Coast Guard struggling to get a lifeline tossed against the mighty wind into your grip. Attempt after attempt, these professionals are failing, and your mind begins to wander towards the acceptance of fate. All the while, the solemn face with a worried smile and big, innocent eyes stare up at you. This face is the reason you are out there, the reason you called for help in the first place. This face is the reason you will fight until the biting water pulls you under, for this is the face of your six-year-old son. Welcome back to Tragedy with a View. Dun dun. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. You made it past, past the intro this time, though. I was trying to be timely and appropriate. I would also like to let our viewers know that we are using a different microphone this time, so I apologize for any, if your dun-dun-dun sounds different this time. Meaning, if it's super loud, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, edit the volume down on this a little bit. Um, but yeah, my microphones are... Uh... Took the poop. <laughs> Took a poop. Not took the poop. I mean, they might have took the poop. That's the fair. The poop to end them all. <laughs> they went to the shit graveyard. Okay, first, I want to say two things. One, the information for the story I pulled out of a book that I was reading for a different story that we're going to do at a later date now, because I liked this one more. The book is called Coming Back Alive. And the name of the guy is Spike Walker. And he is or was a logger in Alaska. Is that not the most on-brand name? Yes. I am just dazzled. You're not entertained. The only thing I can think of is Dexter. Dexter? Cartoon? No. Dexter. The, oh, the murderer. The, yeah. He at the end of the very last season he's he's just a logger okay i have i have not watched dexter clearly <laughs> for all the viewers out there that know about dexter and the final scene after the hurricane you you'll understand but that's what i think about when i think about loggers and if you heard dexter and also thought of the cartoon you're my people Dexter is a good cartoon. It is. Okay, so that was one thing. The second thing is there is a video that I'm going to put the link in the show notes for about this story and what happened. And I think it's like 15 to 20 minutes long. It's not very long. It is a fantastic watch. They have a lot of good information there. And live footage from the awards that they they gave these guys for what they did and it was just really touching watch it link will be in the show notes so we are talking about jim blades who moved to Alaska in 1982 where he worked a variety of jobs because he was extremely handy he had a history of working in timber, and because he could drive heavy equipment and also repair the equipment, he found work relatively easily. Not to mention that in Alaska at this time, they were basically just like trying to get people to come do any job at all. So there was a lot of demand for the jobs, but then he also ended up being good at the jobs. Where at in Alaska? I believe he kind of bounced around all over. But he ends up settling down near Sitka. In Alaska at this time, residents were allowed to salvage 10,000 board feet of free timber per person per year. And what this means is that the boards were cut from the tree, being 
one inch thick and 12 inches wide, and then measuring 12 inches in length per foot. So Jim, being as handy as he is, eventually goes into business himself and he builds his own sawmill and cut his own lumber to then build his own house. Now his house is not the house that you're probably thinking of. He built and lived on a floating home 40 miles from town in a place that had nearly no radio contact, no neighbors, and no emergency care. The raft his home was floating on was about 25 feet wide and 40 feet long, and it also had a shop and sauna built into it or onto it. He was able to rig the sauna to run off of fresh water that was piped from a nearby creek, and a generator ran the shed. All of these buildings on the raft were on top of skids, so that way if he decided he wanted to stay put on land instead of floating on the water, he would pull the buildings off of the raft and then just kind of take up space wherever he wanted. Jim also owned a boat which was 26 feet long and he named it the Bluebird and it was this boat that he would use to go fishing as well as tow his homestead through water to new locations. Jim originally grew up in Wyoming and on a visit there he met the woman who would become his wife, Jill, and he tried really hard to scare her off and told her that she had good teeth and they would be good for helping to soften the hides of animals that he trapped and killed. That's how you that's how you rope them in. That, I, I mean, I said something similar to you, right? And I was like, sold. <laughs> yeah, we're real big trappers and hunters and living in the wild out here. My packaged meat and sweet and sour chips i just have to go hunt for them at the store or set up traps a couple of them probably need like seven or golden chopsticks in columbus ohio yep go there if you want sweet and sour sauce that's the best that exists (laughs) thus far so the hides he used to kind of repurpose into clothing or rugs or blankets and whatnot. So he was like real frontier living. I mean, this guy lived on a boat in Alaska. So that seems on brand. He lived on a raft. He did live on a raft. He lived on the water. He that's, had a sauna. That's what I, well, I know. Yeah, he's super handy. Yes. He he's incredibly handy. Kayla's rethinking her life decision. She's like... Take I me got, to Alaska. I got pretty good teeth. <laughs> oh no, I don't I don't want to bite onto anything. No, thank you. So he also told her that Alaska was extremely harsh and they pretty much had the same weather all year round. The only difference was the temperature of the rain. Which does not sound appealing. After about three months, they got married, and eventually they had two boys named Clint and Kurt, and they settled in near Sitka, Alaska. They were so remote that whenever they left their homes and were on land, they carried a rifle with them because brown bears were prevalent, and they often enjoyed seeing a family of sea otters play near one of the streams they stayed near to pump water for their sauna. On December 9th, 1987, it was about lunchtime when Jim and six-year-old Clint went out on the water to do some fishing for salmon and cod. It was only 3 p.m., but because of the way the sun rises and sets in Alaska, the sun was already setting, and with reefs and islands and rocks and cliffs kind of encompassing the area they were in, and the darkness that was descending upon them, Jim decided that they would wait to head home, especially because it would take them about two hours to get to town to drop off their load of fish, and then they would still have to travel home from there. They didn't typically stay out overnight, but because of everything else that they had to do, they decided that they would, and then head back home the following morning, and Jim radioed Jill to let her know not to expect him home until the next day. 
That's interesting that he's taking his six-year-old son on basically a work trip. Starting him out young. Overnights. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's relatively normal for people who work in remote locations. And then there's also the fact that, you know, you get them involved really young. And they don't necessarily realize at the point that, you know, they can kind of boycott things that they're they're I guess being asked to go to work essentially. So as they settled in and I want to preface this with, this is mind-boggling to me. Apparently, the waves were swelling close to 20 feet high or 6 meters, but because there were no white caps on them, Jim wasn't worried. The average wave swell in the waters near Sitka, Alaska is about 8 feet or 2.5 meters, and when severe storms pummel the area, waves can grow larger than 46 feet or 14 meters. That is very large. I guess it makes sense with the the white caps. I wonder if that has to deal with like the speed of the water. Like if it's going too fast, then it will like turn over. So if it's not and it's just like bobbing up and down, then I mean they have a pretty big boat. Twenty six feet is pretty big. Yeah, I or twenty something. Yeah, there is twenty six feet. You're right. All that I can you know, compare this to, and I haven't spent a whole lot of time on the water, and I don't really like spending a whole lot of time on the water, but when I traveled back and forth to the islands a whole bunch a few few years ago, there was one night that a storm came in, and they were basically shutting the boats down, and they were like, this is the last boat, and then we're docking for the night, we're not doing anything else, and I know that the waves were about six feet and this, this, it was a farrier. It was a boat meant to shuttle people and cars. There were a lot of cars. There were a lot of people. It was the last boat. And this boat was rocking so hard. I cannot imagine what 20 foot wave swells will do. But I do want to mention that wave height is not the only consideration for rough seas as you also need to pay attention to how close the waves are together, which is also more telling of the severity of a storm. So basically, I've come to the conclusion that you just have to be a different breed to live in Alaska. I agree. So at this time on the water, the waves went from being calm and steady to aggravated as gusts of wind increased from 30 miles per hour to 70 miles per hour, or 56 kilometers per hour to 113 kilometers per hour. And this happened without much warning to Jim at all. There was an emergency radio broadcast explaining the storm that was coming in and the location it was going to be hitting and that those in the area needed to take shelter. Unfortunately, Jim missed this broadcast and so he basically had no idea that a storm was coming. As soon as he saw the winds picking up and the waves begin to to pick up and kind of create that white cap and crest over... He knew that he needed to do something, and so he told Clint to put on his survival suit, which I didn't really know what a survival suit was, so I pulled this description just from, like, I'm sure it was, like, Wikipedia or something. I googled survival suit, and that this is what I pulled. It is a type of waterproof dry suit intended to protect the wearer from hypothermia if immersed in cold water or otherwise exposed after abandoning a vessel, especially in the open ocean. Does it look different than a normal wetsuit? They are bright orange. Oh. I've got a, I've got a little bit more. Are they like inflatable? It has, I don't know about the, in the 80s if they had this like inflatable neck pillow thing but they do now have this like inflatable section for your head. Um, We're going to talk a little bit more about the survival suits, especially when they come into play. 
um, survival suits are typically made out of neoprene, they, which is a completely waterproof fabric that insulates the wearer and protects them from hypothermia. The suit has oversized boots to be able to fit over a variety of feet and boot sizes, and some have gloves that are like attached on, others do not. And they contain a special waterproof zipper that zips up the front and seals with a flap tight against the neck right underneath the chin. If this zipper is not properly maintained, the suit is useless as it will allow water in. So Jim pulls up his anchor and he starts to maneuver the bluebird out away from shore and the rocks where he was because he was worried that the storm was going to kind of just pick him up and push him either onto shore or into a cliff or onto the rocks and, you know, wreck his boat and then they would be stranded. A blizzard had already started dumping snow and was blowing the wind and waves so hard that Jim lost track of the shoreline. And a moment later, the bluebird collided with some jagged rocks. Do they have lighthouses in Alaska? Or is that like a warm, warm area thing? I am sure that there are lighthouses in Alaska, but there were not lighthouses here in this area i will also say the waves were so big that they were causing a visibility problem so the bluebird collides with rocks and jim could hear the crunching of the wood and knew that he was in trouble he threw his boat in reverse and started trying to move away from the rocks when again he then collided with a cliff of saint lazaria island so they did get pushed up against something Yes. Not once, but twice. It's not good. Not what you want. Nope. Again, he reversed. He was finally able to maneuver the bluebird into open water and didn't even bother going to check the damage that had been done to his boat. He knew that it was going to sink. That's not good. You're going to be saying that. Yeah, you're going to be saying that a lot in this episode. Jim looks at Clint, and this was when he decided that he needed to call for help. The term shippers use is mayday, and the U.S. Coast Guard in Sitka answered immediately. He later admits that if Clint was not with him, he would not have called for help. 18 minutes after the call, a crew was in the air heading their way to Jim and Clint's rescue. They flew an HH-3F Pelican helicopter, which is also called a Sea King, and it has twin engines, a fully retractable landing gear, and was considered amphibious, meaning it was perfect for the Alaskan wilderness. Did you know? (laughs) I am sure I don't. (laughs) That Sea King is a Pokemon. (laughs) (laughs) Side note, Sam has been obsessed with Pokemon cards lately, and it is infiltrating my phone, and now my Facebook marketplace is filled with Pokemon cards, and I haven't looked up Pokemon cards once, so we know for sure it's coming from him. Yep. And the Sea King is apparently a Pokemon. Now you know. It is. On board was pilot commander John Whidden, co-pilot lieutenant greg breathop carl sailor to operate the hoist mark mylene to operate avionics and jeff tunks as the rescue swimmer jeff had been the first to board the helo and while waiting for the others he felt a gust of wind slam into the side and drag the helo several feet across the tarmac inside They encountered heavy snow and severe turbulence as soon as they took off. Because of the snow and ice, their radar went out at their radar went out at their normal elevation of 300 feet, and they had to lower the elevation down to 75 feet before they were able to get it to turn back on. The wind, gusting at upwards of 90 miles per hour, was so strong that it kept grabbing a hold of the helicopter, and almost like you see umbrellas 
when the wind grabs the umbrellas and it like turns them inside out and like pl- like tr- pretty much pulls them out of your grip. That's essentially what was happening with this helicopter. The wind was catching the blades and ripping it backwards. And then as the wind flowed, gravity took over and it would start pulling the helicopter down towards the waves. I wonder what the like conditions are for the Coast Guard to not go out. Because these sound pretty bad. Like, that helicopter could just crash. I agree. And there have been many crashes in this area. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is their quote-unquote job, like, to go out in these conditions. But, like, I'm curious on the boundaries. I'm sure they have some. I mean, in the last episode, Lexi and I talked about a storm that hit Mount, Mount Denali and there were multiple days where they refused to fly because they wouldn't be able to see anything because of the storm and it was too risky for their their people so i'm sure there are limits this sounds worse <laughs> oh no okay this this no this is going to they're going to crash they could just be pulled into the water i I'm not going to say that one was worse than the other because there are very clear risks in in the locations of of both uh, both of them are in Alaska. I'm doing two a- episodes in Alaska in a row. So Alaska December. Well, November December. Alaska holiday season. Enjoy your time in Alaska. We're going to Utah next. Um, <laughs> no, I just, they're they are different. And, you know, like I said, I'm sure that they do have limits to when they go out. Clearly, though, this was not in crossing those lines. So they, they made it out. And um, Commander Whitten wasn't even supposed to be on duty that night and lieutenant braithop were doing everything that they could and basically had everything turned on to full power and the helicopter still wasn't responding when the wind was grabbing a hold of it but they continued to fight through every single wind gust and eventually got to the location that jim and clint were in Witten started trying to locate them, but the gear they used, specifically the direction finding equipment, which will find a radio signal while the radio is being used, wasn't working. After multiple attempts, Jim finally stepped out on deck and shined his flashlight into the air. For a split second, as the wave lifted the bluebird high into the air, Carl saw the light and they were able to track them down this way instead of using technology. That is very fortunate. That seems very lucky. I agree. I agree. There's a lot of luck in this, too. Once they... Once they were able to somewhat hover over the boat, they realized two things. First, that the bluebird was already sitting at a 45-degree angle and the entire bow was under the water. And second, because the boat was sinking, there wasn't enough room on deck for the basket that Jim and Clint would need to go into for the rescue. Still, they tried to lower the basket down to them, and in a sudden swoop, a gust of wind raging up to 110 miles per hour swept the helo up, tossing it backwards and had it plummeting toward the freezing water. Somehow, as if every member of the crew accepted what they felt was inevitable, peace came over the helo, and it righted itself, and they quickly got back to work. After several attempts to get the basket near them, Whitten decided that they would not be able to use the boat as a tool, and they needed Jim and Clint to get into the water. Jim had already secured Clint in the child-size survival suit, which is less of a suit and more of a body bag. It has slots for your arms, but the legs were one large section, and it was made to attach to an adult survival suit back to front, so a child would be attached to an adult like an otter. Adults would be able to lay back, and the child would then be lifted a little bit farther out of the water. 
Jim, putting on his survival suit, found that the zipper wasn't working properly and he couldn't zip it up all the way and seal it at the neck like you are supposed to. And this would not keep the freezing water out. Doing exactly what was asked anyways, Jim attached Clint to himself and then calmly walked off the side of the boat and into the violent water. Clint, however, was terrified and clutching and trying to hold on to anything that he could. As a six-year-old in a raging storm should. I agree. And would. I agree. Unfortunately, this action did not help them at first. The wind was so strong that it just pressed Jim and Clint against the boat and they had absolutely no control or ability to move away from it. Still, Wooden instructed Carl to lower the basket down to them and after five to six failed attempts, they knew that they needed to try something different, especially as they watched the bluebird slip below the surface of the water and into darkness. Once in the open water, Jim and Clint were continuously pummeled and getting pulled under by the waves. Jim felt his survival suit taking on water and he was scared that the water would cause him to get hypothermia and lose control of his body and he would not be able to unlatch his son before he himself died. But he didn't want to unlatch Clint from him too early because the waves were so violent that he knew he would not be able to hold on to him otherwise. At this time, they decided Jeff needed to get ready to go in the water. Jeff slides into a safety strap, which goes over his head, and it would allow him to be lowered towards the water before raising both arms and sliding out of the strap and into the water. Then Jeff put on his snorkel, mask, and fins and slipped out the door of the helo and into the open air. The intention as Jeff is able to look down and see Jim and Clint directly below him, is to slip into the water, grab a hold, Jim and Clint, swim them to the basket, get them inside, and then have them hoisted up into the helo. Once inside the helo, the basket would get dropped back down for him, and ta-da, the job would be done. As easy as that, right? One, two, three... Quickly, he realized that this was about to be the ride of a life, as he was now getting whipped around like a cat toy. Like one of those fish, those fish cat toys. Yeah. Have you seen those? I assume that it's probably, I mean, I've only ever had like the string that had like the tassel on the end, but I'm assuming it's the same thing. It's a fish. Yeah. That wiggles. Oh. Automatically. Interesting. Because he was getting tossed around so violently, the safety strap tightened and Jeff found himself struggling to release himself into the water. About 100 yards from his view of Jim and Clint, Jeff finally found success and fell into the water. By then, he had lost track of where Jim and Clint were and started frantically looking for them. In the helo, Witten could see that Jeff was turning in circles and looking around him, and without having to confirm that Jeff was unable to locate Jim and Clint, he turned the searchlight to light them up, and Jeff, with no way to communicate with Witten, followed that light. Jeff saw Jim, swam up behind him, grabbed a hold of his shoulders, and turned him around and came face to face with Clint, who seemed to be so calm despite everything that was going on. When Jim asked if they'd be able to get them out, Jeff replied, no worries, we do this all of the time. But that wasn't the entire truth. At this time, the rescue swimmer program was only 10 months old with the Coast Guard, and in order to become a rescue swimmer, Jeff attended a four-week-long course where those attending at least once a day feared for their life. But these actions is what prepared them to be successful in real-life situations. Out of the 35 men who started this training with Jeff, only 12 made it to the end. With Jeff in the water, Carl lowered the basket down, and as Jeff directed Jim and Clint toward it, they were almost within reach when the wind caught the helo and ripped it away, taking the basket with them. Six tries later, they finally had success. Jim and Clint were rolled into the basket and lifted into the air and into the helo. In total, Jim and Clint were in the water for about 40 minutes. That's not looking good for Jim. 
Three to four more attempts later, Jeff was also in the basket and getting hoisted back up toward the helo. A gust of wind again grabbed control of the helo, and Witten and Braithop were doing everything they could to fight it. And hanging below as the helo got tossed around was Jeff, who was getting whipped back and forth, and at one point the basket nearly collided with the underside of the helo. Then those inside heard an explosion. The basket, with Jeff inside, had collided with a wave so violently that it caused the entire helo to vibrate, and it ripped the snorkel and mask off of Jeff's face. Two more waves, and finally Witten and Braithop were able to pull the helo free of the wind and lift it high above the waves. Carl, as he hoisted Jeff high, was crying, thinking that he had killed Jeff. Cranking the lift a final time, Carl pulled Jeff aboard, who rolled out of the basket, crawled along the floor, and into his seat. Once there, he looked at Jim and Clint and gave them a thumbs up. Good for him. (laughs) I mean... He does this all the time. All the time, yeah. I mean... Should have trusted his words. I mean... He knew what he's talking about. The kind of blessing and a curse was that this was the you know, professional swimmer who was getting attacked by the water and the waves. It would have been worse if it was the pedestrians. The six-year-old boy. I agree. At the same time, Jill and their younger son, Kurt, who was four at the time, were sitting home when they noticed blast of air tearing through where their floating home was sitting. The home rocked hard to one side and then the other, and the cables tethering their home in place were groaning loudly under the strain brought by the wind. Jill grabbed her radio in an effort to reach Jim, but was unsuccessful. Clicking through the stations, Jill suddenly heard his voice. He was talking to the Coast Guard, and she was able to gather that he had already called for help, and the Coast Guard was coming to get him. She stayed on that channel and listened but because of the setup of her radio and her location she was unable to connect in and talk to them herself jill and kurt heard the coast guard as they hovered over jim and as they had him and clint in their sights and then the channel went silent as time stretched on jill's worry turned into panic she called their neighbors quote unquote neighbors and ah, good joke. And They're 10 mile plus neighbors. It was a community. Mm. She she called her neighbors and asked to start a prayer chain. And when one of the neighbors offered to come pick her up and take her and Kurt into town, she immediately said no, that she didn't want anyone else to risk their lives in the storm. Half an hour later, her radio cracked. Mrs. Blades, she heard, answering with a simple yes, a member of the Coast Guard replied, we got them. Woo! And for this incredible rescue, the air crew was awarded the ANA Award for Outstanding Achievement and also received the Distinguished Flying Cross. That's nice. Oh, you should use the meme. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them. Well, that's what I got today. That was interesting. That was wild. I would have been very scared. But people that deal with water rescue and the Navy and those people are crazy. They're You know what? Different. You know what? What? In the last episode with Lexi. I am literally never going to forget this. So Lexi, if you're listening, thank you so much. I made a comment about how the guys are crazy. And she was like, they're amazing. What guys? The guys climbing the mountain. Oh. But she was like, they're amazing. And I was like, they're also crazy. And she was like, yeah, they're crazy, but they're amazing. And I I think that applies here too. They're crazy, but it makes them amazing. Yes. And they do amazing things. And they save lives. And... Thanks for being on this ride with me. Thank you for listening. We got him. We got him.